of the Chemical Safety, Waste Management, Environmental Justice and Regulatory Oversight Subcommittee on the Environmental and Public Health Dangers and Solutions in Regard to Plastics. The folk singer Pete Seeger once said, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted or redesignated or removed from production. Well, we're here to explore kind of that, that philosophy in the context of uh, how to have our containers and, and uh, packaging uh, have a longer life and serve us better than the single-use world we're often living in. Generations have grown up believing the mantra of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and then everything's resolved. But we know with uh, plastics only about 8% and it's dropped, I think this last year to 6% is uh, recycled. Instead it gets the three B's. It's buried, it's burned, it's borne out to sea. It really has a remarkable, almost near eternal lifespan. Just plastics break down into smaller and smaller pieces until they're microplastics. They're in our lungs, they're in our bloodstream, they're in the breast milk we feed our babies. They're full of all kinds of, of chemicals that we don't necessarily want in our bodies or our bloodstream or our breast milk. That's to say nothing of the massive amount of fossil fuels needed to produce single-use plastics. Now, I was thinking back to um, when I was in grade school and Alpenrose Dairy had a box on our front porch, and they dropped off the uh, milk in a glass jar, and then the glass jar, empty glass jug, went back into the box, and, and according to whatever you've ordered, other products uh, showed up, and those glass jars just got used uh, eternally. Uh, or when I was, uh, after my senior year of high school, I was working as a mechanic, and uh, uh, the lunchroom had a vending machine and I would get uh, an, an orange soda in glass jar, and every time one, or a glass bottle, every time one was different, I'd put it up on the wall. And by the end of the summer, had, I don't know, eight to 12 different evolutions because the, the bottles were simply washed and reused and reused and reused. Well, the old sometimes becomes the new. Ideas that we had in the past get looked at again as we face different issues. With reusable containers, Consumers can either refill containers or return them to be sanitized, refilled, or restocked on store shelves. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is represented here today by one of our witnesses, estimates that replacing just 20% of single-use plastic packaging with reusables would be an opportunity worth at least $10 billion of economic activity. The World Economic Forum estimates that reusing just 10% of plastic products would cut annual amount of ocean plastic pollution by 50%. Well, this isn't theoretical. We're already making recycling work in Oregon. Oregon was the first state to require that all bottles are returnable with a deposit, and 90% of our bottles are recycled. It's a program that employs about 500 people across the, the state. Even some of our Oregon brewers are now using a common beer bottle that can be cleaned and refilled up to 40 times, meaning they don't need to, to the bottle, that is they being the bottles, don't need to be crushed or melted or remade after every use. Well, that actually does go right, right back to the experience we had early in the bottle bill in my, in my state. And it's not just bottles we're, we're talking about, it's just not drinks we're talking about. At 25 Fred Meyer stores in the Met Portland metropolitan area and some giant grocery stores right here in DC, customers can buy products from name brands like Cascade, Clorox, Gillette, in reusable containers from Loop, an innovative company that is also represented on today's panel. We're fortunate to have a few witnesses who will help us learn more about how you build a culture and an economy of reusables. We are joined by Daisy Meng from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which focuses on the issue of plastics and rebuilding a, a circular economy. We're also joined by Clement Schmidt, who is the general manager for Loop, a social enterprise whose mission is, quote, eliminating the idea of waste. Uh, with them is uh, Tim Debus. Did I get that right? Uh, Debus. 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 The president and CEO of Reusable Packaging Association, whose member companies promote reusable transport packaging systems like pallets, bins, and containers. Thank you all for being here this morning. And with that, let me turn things over to the ranking member of the committee, Senator Mullen. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to start thanking, uh, start by thanking all of our witnesses for attending uh, this hearing today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us today. It's um, not always an easy trip to get here to, to Washington, D.C., and it's definitely not an easy trip getting back home. Uh, so we do want to thank you for taking the time to, um, to enlighten us and share your thoughts and your experiences. Um, as I said in our first subcommittee hearing, I believe free market innovation is the best way to promote sustainability in all forms of waste manage it, management, whether uh, it be in reusable packaging or recycling. However, as we discuss potential solutions, we must ensure America's supply chains remain productive and competitive in the global market. As we have seen in America and in other countries, a one-size-fits-all mandate is not necessarily the right solution especially for smaller businesses who are less likely to be able to absorb those extra costs. Businesses should not be forced to spend time and capital on unnecessary and erroneous regulations that do not serve their customers or their business model. Regulatory overreach has the potential to hamper free market solutions, uh, including for reusable and refillable packaging. These solutions should not require a heavy hand of government to be successful in the marketplace. Our nation's economy thrives when private industry has the right to choose how to tackle these hard uh, to address issues in a way that provides realistic, affordable, and attractive solutions for both consumers and businesses. Otherwise, these ideas simply won't survive. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to hearing your all's testimonies. How you built? You built. Uh, thank you uh, very much, and we'll now turn to our panel. We are grateful for you joining us today and bringing your, your experiences and knowledge. And we'll begin with uh, Daisy Meng from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Chairman Merkley, Ranking Member Mullen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic. As you said, I am Daisy Meng, the Policy and Institutions Senior Manager at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in North America. EMF is a nonprofit organization with the aim of accelerating the transition to a circular economy in order to tackle some of the biggest challenges we face today, like climate change, biodiversity loss, waste, and pollution. This work is more important to me now than ever, as I've just returned last week from maternity leave after having my second son. So I'm very grateful to be here with you all today and be talking about this. Um, anyhow, one of EMF's kind of key areas of focus is plastic. We have published and continue working on research on the topic. We have mobilized businesses and other leaders toward more circular, a more circular economy for plastics. In collaboration with the UN Environment Program, our global commitment has united more than 500 organizations representing 20% of all plastic packaging produced globally behind a common vision of a circular economy for plastics that includes reuse. And we have convened the Business Coalition for a Global Plastics Treaty together with WWF. That brings together over 130 businesses and financial institutions committed to supporting the development of an ambitious, effective, and legally binding UN treaty to end plastic pollution. The Business Coalition has called for global support for reuse policies. Today, I will quickly cover why reuse is key to addressing plastic pollution, what we mean when we talk about reuse, why we need policy intervention, and what policy tools can best support reuse systems. To start, reuse is key to addressing plastic pollution. No single strategy can sufficiently reduce plastic leakage into the oceans. Reducing plastic pollution requires a comprehensive and integrated set of solutions from material redesign, plastic reduction, substitution, and reuse, all the way to improved recycling and disposal systems. Reuse is an essential component in this mix and has incredible economic potential. As Senator Merkley said, replacing 20% of single-use plastic packaging with reusable materials represents a $10 billion opportunity. Furthermore, scaling reuse options and new delivery models is key to, de to reducing material consumption, decreasing single-use plastic applications, taking effective action against plastic pollution, and capturing co-benefits. To accelerate collaborative action on scaling reuse, EMF is currently working with reuse partners and experts to show how scaled reuse return systems can perform economically, environmentally, and experientially in comparison to single use. Now for what is reuse or what is a reuse return system? Reuse Reusing packaging means that the packaging is refilled or used again for the same purpose for which it was conceived. Reusable packaging has been designed to be, or has proven it can be, reused a minimum number of times. By contrast, single-use packaging is designed to be used just once. 
when talking about reuse, it may be helpful to think of business to consumer reuse in four different categories. Packages that are refilled at home, refilled on the go, returned from home, or returned on the go. These systems present countless potential benefits, but there are challenges to implementing reuse models in practice, resulting in the need for policy intervention to fully capture the reuse opportunity. Reuse will be a crucial piece of the solution to reduce plastic pollution, but business as usual cannot get us there. Current commitments will only get us a 7% decrease in plastic flow into the ocean by 2040. We need policy intervention to address the barriers to building and scaling the shared infrastructure and systems required to make the economics work and maximize the environmental benefits of reuse. The Business Coalition for a Global Plastics Treaty has called for policy support to encourage further investments into reuse and refill systems, recommending realistic targets combined with effective economic incentives, definitions, and metrics to shift the supply chain. Businesses want a level playing field and they need policy to get there. We need ambitious binding reuse targets to reach the scale and shared infrastructure needed. We need measures to make the economics work, like extended producer responsibility, deposit return schemes, tax breaks, grant funding, et cetera. And we need harmonized definitions and design to help ensure that we are building efficient, beneficial, and scalable systems. These policies will keep packaging and the economy at its highest value for as long as possible and avoid the production of virgin plastics. It is best if these policies are packaged together at the federal level and are consistent with action underway at the global level. While local and small-scale solutions have demonstrated the opportunity and will continue to play a key role in the implementation of reuse systems, we need cohesive federal action to accelerate progress. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, and welcome back from maternity leave, and congratulations. Was it, you said your second son? All right, that's just awesome. That's the best, best part of life is raising those kids. We're going to turn next uh, to... Um, uh, Clemens Schmid, who serves as general manager at Loop Global. We'll look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Merkley and committee members, for the opportunity to speak at this hearing. I am Clement Schmidt, general manager of Loop, a global reuse platform launched by TerraCycle. As background, TerraCycle, headquartered in Trenton, New Jersey, is on a mission to eliminate the idea of waste. We employ over 500 people providing national recycling, recycled content, and reuse services in 20 countries for 20 years. We run national platforms to collect and recycle hard to recycle products and packages, ranging from flexible food packaging to personal protective equipment, toothbrushes to peel blister pack, and even cigarette butts and dirty diapers. TerraCycle manages the largest contact lens and eye care recycling program in the United States and is the world's leading recycler of coffee capsules and beauty waste, to just name a few. TerraCycle launched Loop in 2019. Loop enables brands and retailers to shift from single-use packaging system to a reusable one in the most convenient and way possible. As a result, we have partnered with the leading retailers in the United States, France, and Japan, from Walmart to Carrefour, as well as 200 leading consumer goods companies from Procter & Gamble to Nestle. In focusing on the three most important stakeholders to transition from disposable to reusable consumption, consumers, brands, and retailers, the primary goal of Loop has been to enable the transition to reuse in the least disruptive way possible. For consumers, the shopping experience is the same. Simply buy your everyday product at your preferred retailer. There is no requirement to clean or refill oneself. The only new concept is a fully refundable deposit attached to each container at purchase. This deposit is then reimbursed in full upon the return of the empty package at any participating location, regardless of where it was purchased. As you can see here, the goal is to make a reusable purchase feel like a disposable one. For brand, Loop is able to integrate any disposable product from baby food to motor oil to peanut butter, shampoo, or laundry detergent with the goal of driving the least amount of change to existing supply chains as possible. In fact, the only change to enable reuse with Loop is to shift from disposable container to a reusable one. For retailers, everything stays the same as with a disposable product distribution. 
The only change is to enable a loop return bin at the front of their stores. <coughs> loop acts as a central platform steward and is operationally the waste management function of reuse. We collect back the empty used container, sort, store, and clean them, and we return deposit. Our objective is to make reuse as convenient and affordable as single use. Reuse has to be part of our future. Reuse is better for the environment. This has been shown multiple times in different studies like third-party reviewed, life cycle assessment from both the private and public sector. Reuse creates more job. It creates significantly more domestic job than disposal or even recycling. Reuse avoids the negative impact of disposable plastic production, a form of pollution that affects predominantly disadvantaged and minority communities in the United States. Reuse is financially viable. It has run at scale in the United States until the 1950s, and today runs at scale in Canada with beer, all the way to Germany with most beverages, as well as in the business-to-business -business sector with secondary and tertiary packaging. By treating packaging as an asset versus a cost of goods sold, the Loop Platform enables manufacturers to innovate and create better packaging. In the process, manufacturers become financially motivated to make their packages as long-lasting as possible. Reuse is proven with consumers, brands, and retailers. The key to unleashing the full environmental and economic opportunity is simply to scale. More product available in more stores and more return points. But scaling reuse requires investment from private actors to invest the business needs certainty. We believe the government can support this in two ways. Support through legislation. For example, we are very supportive of reuse being part of Senator Merkley National Bottle Bill and would recommend not to limit it to bottle only. Providing public funding to scale reuse. This funding should be focused on the infrastructure creation and the reuse platform operators. Now is the moment to act. Delaying action could stall the measurable progress that have been made towards a more sustainable future and set us back decades. With existing consumer demand, voluntary action underway, government support will be the catalyst of, to turn reuse into a full-scale national reality. I urge you to actively support reuse through legislation and investment. I appreciate the opportunity to provide that testimony and would be pleased to address any question. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much uh, for bringing the, you know, your expertise on this model to uh, the panel for discussion and education. Appreciate it. And we're going to now turn to uh, Tim Debus. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Merkley, Ranking Member Mullen, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to share insights on reusable packaging and the important role of reuse infrastructures for not only environmental benefit, but also for economic value creation and social well-being. My name is Tim Debus, and I represent the nonprofit Global Trade Organization for the Reusable Transport Packaging Industry. The Reusable Packaging Association, or RPA, consists of businesses that supply, use, and provide services to supply chain packaging products like pallets, bulk bins, containers, trays for their continuous use in a managed system featuring the packaging's recovery, maintenance, and return for their intended purpose. Today, RPA member companies are collectively involved in handling or servicing billions of reusable transport movements each year for commercial goods worldwide. Still, overall, reusable packaging is the minority share in the supply chain. I want to emphasize three points on reusable packaging as part of the solution for single-use waste. First, reuse is not about the material or the product, but the system. No packaging can be considered reusable unless it can be collected, returned, and prepared cost-effectively for another use. We need to be systems thinkers when it comes to solving complex environmental problems. And this is the crux of reusable packaging in which collaboration and coordination within operating systems lead to eliminating solid waste and pollution. Also, reusable packaging is material neutral, typically made from plastics, wood, aluminum, or glass. 
The key is product designed for durability, not disposability, using safe and recyclable materials, and having the system in place to ensure repeated use and end-of-life recycling. Plastic-based reusable packaging can be very effective in a managed system where product utility is extended and plastic material is valued. In my written testimony, I cite several real-world examples about how RPA member companies are keeping plastics in circulation and out of the environment. My second point is that reuse systems are really about getting and generating new economic growth and value. If we only consider reusable packaging in response to environmental problems or sustainability quotas, then we are missing the big picture opportunity. Reusable products can be designed with feature-rich properties that optimize performance and user experience and embed technologies for smart data capturing outputs. These properties can save money in transportation and warehousing, reduce food damage and waste, offer ergonomic designs for worker safety, perform with automated or robotic handling systems, and most excitingly, bring tech-enabled visibility to supply chains. Reuse also builds resiliency in business operations by being available and already available for use, avoiding volatile raw material pricing and supply constraints that can interfere with the endless manufacturing of single-use products. A national strategy that incentivizes reusable packaging systems can have far-reaching economic impacts. With reuse, we can achieve both economic and environmental prosperity. My third point is that there are federal policy, uh, many federal policy opportunities to support reuse infrastructures, but we need to prioritize reuse and broaden the material scope. The bipartisan infrastructure law less than two years ago heavily invests to transform municipal solid waste management and recycling. Now Congress has the opportunity to prioritize game-changing investments in reuse systems, striking the right balance on complementary pieces to the puzzle, reuse for waste prevention, and recycling for waste management. A national strategy in advancing reusable and refillable packaging systems should prevent waste of all material types, not just plastics. We should institute consistency across waste streams, avoid fragmented efforts in our source reduction initiatives, and change behaviors and culture for the responsible use of all resources. A final comment is that is lesser known, but is very important to our industry, is the need to strengthen enforcement of crime laws and prosecutions pertaining to the theft of stolen reusable packaging assets. We make great products with valued materials, and far too often they are getting stolen, diminishing the reuse potential. We appreciate the, the time uh, to be here today, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you all. Uh, and uh, we're going to dive right into uh, five minute periods. And uh, I'll just jump right in. And, and uh, Ms. Meng, I think your team is involved in the international discussion because plastics in oceans is. For example, not just an American challenge, but a, a global challenge. And so the, um, uh, I think the foundation convened the Business Coalition for Global Plastics Treaty. What is really the, the, the core goal of that? Is it to set targets or, or will it have, is the goal to have requirements that each nation uh, basically says, yes, we're going to, to do X, Y, Z to accomplish those goals? Yeah, so I think if I understand your question, it's about the global, the UN negotiations around the Global Plastics Treaty and whether kind of the business coalition will be looking at um, nationally determined contributions or national action plans where countries are deciding what they're doing or if there will be kind of mandatory components to the international treaty. And um, from EMF's perspective, and I believe also the business coalition's perspective, we need binding reuse targets on the topic of reuse in particular, but binding targets um, in the treaty itself. So rather than kind of having countries self-determining what those targets will be, of course they will be implemented by the individual countries. Right now, I believe the U.S. is is pushing to not have binding targets, uh, and kind of more set a, uh, if you will, kind of a, uh, uh, a happy talk about what could possibly be achieved. Um, but uh, that won't get us there. I agree. Okay. Uh, 
Ms. Schmid, I'm, I'm picturing, uh, for example, the, the plastic jug that I have with uh, liquid laundry detergent. And so you spoke about uh, fully refundable deposits. So in Oregon, we have a deposit on bottles, a 10% deposit, and it's resulted in about a 90% return rate. Is it basically, is the concept extending that, that model to everything else, shampoo bottles, um, laundry detergent bottles, so on and so forth? So the system is about bringing the value into the package, and we know deposit is a very good way to do it without burdening um, the citizen. So yes, it's about bringing a deposit on everything. Okay. Uh, so um, we have a system in Oregon where you throw everything into a bag, and then the bag is, is, is tossed into a tray at a, at a warehouse, and a computer takes a picture of it and immediately evaluates how much of those things are recyclable. And it's an amazing system to watch it in action. It works really well. But, it, but if, if that type of program was extended to other plastic bottles um, of all kinds, uh, do you see that as a workable? Has any state undertaken to really expand? Because it's really set up for you know lots of things that look like a soda bottle. Um, other plastic containers are maybe much larger, maybe much different in shape. But can the same basic system be expanded? So that is about building the infrastructure that is tailored for reuse, uh, as opposed to recycling, as we have in reuse. Every container are sorted individually, and this is what Loop has been demonstrated, not only in the US, but also in Europe and, uh, and in Japan. So the technology would be close to uh, what you're describing, but would be step up in order to be able to isolate packaging at a shape, material, and content level. All right. So. I've, I've got these, these, these bottles right currently. Uh, some of them are reused the, that, through that system I'm describing. Some of them are reused, like the glass bottles that come, but all the plastic ones are essentially ground up uh, for recycling, which means different types of plastic have to be sorted and on what, how much can be rebuilt from them. But you're really, I think, if I understand right, saying the best solution would be for that laundry detergent bottle to be able to be refilled, that is reused, rather than ground up and recreate a new product. Yes, absolutely. It is much better to reuse a product that's existing than having to transform it even through recycling. Okay. So let's say that bottle arrives at a, at a, a central warehouse with other recycled plastics. How do we get that bottle back to the, the manufacturer to be refilled and restocked on the, on the shelf? Is that really a, is that really a practical uh, strategy? It is happening today in the United States and in other countries. That's what Loop is doing. So the way, we, the way we operate is to the point you're describing. We are bringing all of the bottles into a central location when they are being sorted and stored and clean and being sent back to each of the manufacturers. So the manufacturer doesn't have to worry about any of the, the complexities of the, the cleaning, and when you have a, a, a big container of that particular bottle, you can ship it back to the manufacturer, and they just throw it back into their production loop. It's absolutely correct. Well, my five minutes are up, so I'm going to turn to Senator Mullen. Thank you, Chairman. Once again, thank you for the witnesses for being here. Um, I'll start with Mr. Debus. In your testimony, which, by the way, your voice um, carries quite well, I was sitting there listening to you, and I thought maybe you should have a voiceover job too, because uh, I, I was in, I was impressed by that. It reminded me of my uh, my colleague from Oklahoma, James Lankford. He's got one of those voices too. Not much of a face, but a good voice. No, I'm kidding. Not you, sir. Just talking about James. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's a very good friend of mine. But in your testimony, you stated that reusable packaging companies in the supply chain continue to demonstrate success in uh, responsible management of plastics. Um, how can reusable packaging support the upcycling and recycled plastic uh, content? content? Yeah, there is a tremendous amount of uh, great activity taking place uh, in the market, and RPA member manufacturing companies as well 
taking back 100% of their products uh, from the user community in order to recycle and reprocess uh, into new product manufacturing. It's part of that full circle system, uh, that closed loop, if you will, of bringing back their, their products. Uh, they're, they're of value, so they can use them and regrind in recycled material into other products. Um, they also really look to put high recycled content rates in their manufactured uh, products. Uh, one of our member companies uh, has an average uh, of over 80% of recycled content in their pallets and their bulk bins uh, of, of plastic-based uh, products. So there's some, they're achieving uh, really that, that full circularity in terms of utilizing uh, plastic products, but then getting those products back and continuing to use that material when it's time for its recycling and its intended reuse. For upcycling, it's basically taking the, the waste material of recycled resin and putting it back into useful products. Uh, if you look at the EPA waste hierarchy pyramid, it's going from, <clears throat> excuse me, a lower part of the pyramid to going up from recycling to source reduction of reuse. Or in the circular economy uh, technical cycle, it's going from the outer loop of recycling to the inner loop of preferred activity. So it's really an upcycling process of taking the plastic material and putting them into uh, useful and valuable products uh, that then can go from recycling to reuse or waste management to waste prevention and allowed to really, uh, you know, it, it, uh, to uh, get uh, you know, tremendous value associated with the continued life of that product. How, how prevalent is reusable packaging in the supply chain right now in different different markets, various markets? Yeah, reusable uh, packaging for the supply chain are the workhorses of, of commerce. Uh, there is an estimate uh, about uh, of all the industrial and, and consumer products that move in this country, uh, over 90 cent move on a pallet, uh, for example. Um, so they're behind the scenes, uh, but they're ubiquitous uh, in the economies uh, and the markets uh, all around us. It does range pretty considerably between uh, vertical markets. Uh, the automotive industry, for example, is a big user of reusable packaging. They've got more tighter loops between parts to assembly, <clears throat> and they definitely uh, have that continuous uh, uh, program uh, in terms of distributing products uh, for their use. The retail industries, that's where you've got uh, a lot of work that's needed, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for example. Um, so retail is one that, that could definitely use some additional, uh, you know, uh, penetration or adoption associated with reusable packaging. So there's, there's great variability associated with the, the market adoption of reusable packaging for the supply chain. Well, when we start talking about reusable, which is a great concept, I mean, the, the, the chairman brought up the fact that milk deliveries used to be done that way, and I, I understand that. Uh, but every time you touch a product, there's labor cost. And, and cost is associated with anything that we do. It's got to be economically reasonable before us to be able to do that. And so when we start talking about reusable, you start realizing that the most cost in every product out there is labor. So how do we combine those two? Because each time you touch that product, each time you touch it, every time you touch this bottle, every time you touch a, 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 a reusable product, there's costs associated with that. So how do you merge those? Because we have labor costs going through the roof here mm -hmm. in the United States, which is good. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, uh, but it also comes with the cost too. So how do you make that efficient for the consumers? Because ultimately, that's who's buying the product. Anybody want to take that on? It's a hard one, right? <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm happy to kick off. It's a great question, and then look for the builds for my co-panelist. Um, there is cost of labor in the production of single-use packaging also today. So they are not limited to only reuse. I think you're touching on a very good point, but you have proof on business modeling exercise, and we talked about it, about business, which at scale are profitable uh, on a reusable side versus single use, and that's because you're also making savings on reusing your asset as many times as you can. Okay. 
I was going to say, this is where scale or volume becomes uh, critical, is because with volume, we're able to drive down the efficiencies at certain touch points, filling trucks up uh, with full loads when they're being transported, say, from point of collection to point of maintenance or back uh, to the, the packing lines, uh, for example. And so when we talk about scaling reuse, it really is about having that volume efficiencies to be able to optimize the touch points, drive costs down at each step of the way. The unique thing, about, the unique thing about reusable packaging is that it really brings the supply chain or consumers together with, with brands because you all care now about the packaging. The packaging has value to it, whereas today, before with single use, you basically pass uh, that packaging down and you, you know, resolve yourself of no longer having accountability or responsibility of it. With reusable packaging, the touch points is everybody's benefiting from the reusable packaging properties that are designed to be able to work within each of those steps uh, along the supply chain. But it really requires that, that coordination in working in partnership uh, among those who touch the product to be able to you know, optimize those savings as well. And that's where that system thinking comes into play is to be able to uh, really generate the, the, the biggest economic and environmental outcome associated with reuse. Thank you, I went over my time here. I apologize about that. All, all good. Uh, thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman Merkley, and thank you to our uh, ranking member for continuing to focus on the issue of plastics because it is an unnatural substance and does not biodegrade and just breaks down to the smaller and smaller pieces. We are seeing it increasingly um, in things like women's breast milk, in things like the contents of a baby's diaper in things like raindrops falling through the sky in Colorado. So uh, focusing on preventing uh, this and also understanding what the potential harms are of all that microplastic and all that plastic waste, I think is a very valuable use of the committees and subcommittees time. So uh, my plaudits uh, to Senator Merkley for whom this is a great cause and passion. Um, Ms. Schmid, Senator Sullivan and I have done a couple of plastics bills, um, Save Our Seas and Save Our Seas 2.0, and we're in the process of working on Save Our Seas 3.0 right now. And one of the areas uh, in which I expect we will likely focus is the area of recycling and how spectacularly unsuccessful uh, ordinary recycling presently is with less than 10% of what you put in your blue bin actually ending up recycling, with less than 2% of recycled content in new plastics, and um, trying to figure out how to make recycling work, I think it's gonna be a very important uh, piece of this. So I would love to have your advice on what you think the best things are that the federal government could do to promote more effective recycling and to eliminate sham recycling. And if you have a quick response, I'd welcome it now, but I'd also encourage you to take that back as a question for the record and give a more fulsome response if you would care to. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for the question. Um, it is a topic that would require a bit more sustained responses, so I will take it Why back. Why don't we take that, that'd be fine. Response. And in your uh, sector of the economy, Mr. Debos, um, are there incentives or other things that the government could do to encourage more reuse? Um, and in particular, can we get rid of peanuts? Those damn little foam things? Right, right. Make reusable peanuts. Uh, that could be a, it's a nice idea. We should talk after the, the hearing. Uh, uh, a good <clears throat> second use for the damn things, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, no, no question about it. The, the one thing we have to look at is reuse can be very complex in terms of the requirements of that full system to work. Uh, and many times it's an investment. Uh, it, companies are, are putting uh, capital forward uh, to produce a pool of reusable assets or they're changing their, their processes internally and requires additional, uh, uh, additional manpower or streamlining of operations in order to make it work. And so it's an investment in process change. Well, and, do me a favor and, and make us some 
recommendations, if you would, it, on how we can support those we'll process on. changes, because I think it's a win-win situation if you can get over the initial hurdle of um, the investment required to make the process changes. Yeah, thank you. For my uh, last question, uh, Ms. Meng, welcome. Thank you for being here. The other bill that I'm working on is called the Reduce Act, and that would put a fee on virgin plastic that is designated for single-use plastic products, because at the moment, one of the things that is holding back uh, recycling in that area is that it's cheaper to make it new than it is to get it out of recycling. And it's very hard to convince economically motivated entities like corporations to do things that are against their economic interests. So it's a policy choice that we have to make to put recycled plastic and new manufactured plastic onto the same footing. Um, that is the definition of what economists would call a negative externality, that by virtue of using the new plastic, you're adding more plastic to the system, making life more dangerous, adding more waste to the ocean, adding more waste to the uh, system, and putting more of a burden on people. Um, and if there's no charge for that, why would, you know, it's hard to, uh, you're letting people getting away with something that economists would say they should not be allowed to get away with. So if you're a pure market economist, you would want to address this problem. What is MacArthur's advice in this area? Uh, thank you. Excellent question and kind of excellent thoughts on the topic. I think you're entirely correct that we need to be internalizing these externalities and, and bringing ourselves to kind of a level playing field. Um, a, a fee on virgin plastic designated kind of for single-use plastics I think is a logical way to do that. There are countless tools that we can use, but the reality is that we need to be doing something to, to level the playing field. Um, so I Take a look at the REDUCE Act and get back to us with any comments or thoughts you might have, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for this. Again, I think um, a lot of American corporations have developed a partial market economy business model as to, uh, you know, free market when it comes to their pricing and selling of their product, but uh, passing on to the public, socializing uh, the externalities that they may cause. That just isn't market theory. And the selective use of market theory has caused a lot of harm, whether it's in carbon emissions or in plastic waste or across the board. And thank you for continuing your focus in this area. Uh, thank you very much. And, and, and we're looking forward to, uh, is it Save Our Seas? What's the uh, Save name? Save Our Seas 3.0, bipartisan collaboration. And I know those of us who live on the coast, and, and I think you were doing that with Senator Sullivan, right? And uh, I know uh, Alaska, uh, we, we hear a lot about their concerns about the Pacific gyre and the amount of plastic waste that washes up, uh, as well as the- We pick it up on our shores water. with garbage yeah. bags. They have to pick it up on their shores with front end loaders and dumpsters because yeah. of the Pacific flow of plastic waste. A absolutely, uh, thank you. And I think it's an interesting point about the, the economics involved because uh, my impression uh, back, going back to when Oregon first implemented recycling of bottles, and all the bottles were glass, is that the, uh, those who, who delivered the product were happy to have the bottles washed and reused because it was cheaper than buying a new bottle because uh, it takes a lot of energy to create a glass bottle melting. Uh, it was the folks who made the bottles who at that point were extremely resistant because obviously they'd get to sell less bottles if the existing bottles were, were, were reused. But with plastics, the economics often are different uh, in that it can be cheaper, as my colleague uh, pointed out, uh, to make a new one than to recycle an existing piece. But it's the externalities of the impact of that plastic downstream that aren't taken into uh, account. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Ms. Meng, uh, as the foundation has worked with partners to implement larger scale reuse and refill, are there like a top three, here are the biggest obstacles we've encountered? Excellent question, and I will kind of look to the rest of the panel also for their experience. But I do think that the challenge that we see from folks is we have had businesses asking for a level playing field because 
the, the need for shared infrastructure at scale, kind of standardized infrastructure um, is, is crucial. And so in an individual company, it's a real challenge to kind of build out that infrastructure to establish sufficient collection points or access points for consumers. Um, and so they're looking for policy intervention to really help bring folks together to collaborate to get the shared infrastructure at scale that they need to make it work economically. So I think that's kind of the big challenge that we're hearing. At scale, it just gets a lot cheaper. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, Ms. Schmid, um, as you, we think about plastic bottles being reused, and is there a consumer challenge? Consumers get very used. They, you know, they want their oranges to look orange, and they want their apples with no bruises, and they're kind of used to that kind of the perfect product on the shelf. So do we find with, with uh, uh, plastic bottles that are reused that consumers go, oh, why is this, why is this bottle got scratches on it? Or uh, is there a, is, are consumers accepting and, and the manufacturers happy with the consumer response of reused plastic uh, bottles? Thank you for the question. Reusable packaging have, are going to rotate several times, and that's something that from our own per, per experience, we are seeing consumers really willing to accept. It's also in the hands of the manufacturer to design the right durable package that is meeting their consumer needs. And then we have a whole industry that has very strong experience in designing product and packaging that delights consumers on a daily basis. And I have fully confidence based on the work that we have seen already on the platform today that we are able to deliver against those needs. Well, let me ask you the same question I asked Ms. Meng, which is, uh, as you work on this project, what are the kind of the top three uh, challenges you're, you're encountering? I would say there is only one challenge. The challenge is scale. We talked about it uh, previously in talking about labor cost. Costs will be viable once there is sufficient units to uh, flow through the system. What is required is really a system that is competitive versus single use also in a number of units that flow through the system. Thank you. And Mr. Debus, um, I was picturing these plastic pallets. I'm more familiar with uh, uh, wooden pallets, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, I'm also familiar with how those wooden pallets break apart, degrade, and so on and so forth. Are the plastic pallets a more durable product? Is that part of why they found acceptance? They can be, uh, for sure. Uh, and many of them are, are designed to last uh, uh, for many years, uh, hundreds uh, of uses. Uh, and so there could be some durability uh, properties that uh, plastic pallets offer that, say, wood does not. Uh, we are seeing some great advancements, though, in wood uh, pallet suppliers performing reuse uh, capabilities, uh, such as uh, offering uh, inventory management uh, programs uh, and working directly with customers on a, a managed pool of wood products, uh, wood pallets, they can take back and, of course, repair and put them in place. And so uh, we are seeing some, some reuse models even get into the, the wood pallet uh, industry as well. And several of our members are wood pallet uh, supplier and pooler companies. I have so many uh, uh, additional questions, uh, but I'm out of time. I have another hearing that's just started, but our, our chair of environment and public works has arrived, and uh, so I'm going to turn the, turn the hearing over to you. If you'd like to also continue to uh, go as long as you want. Uh, did, you, did you want to do any more? I'm good. Uh, so the, the hearing is yours, and if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, eat. I'll leave. God, do, do the Lord's work. When when I finish my qu uh, questions, should I uh, uh, gavel out? What should I do? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll give Happy you the to script. do it. Thanks very much. All right. Ms. Ming, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Nice to see you. Um, sometimes uh, we hear uh, from critics of circular uh, economy uh, movement that our reliance on plastic and other single uh, uh, use items has become so ubiquitous that uh, the only policy solution is to improve our ability to recycle these products. Uh, at, uh, while this is uh, certainly one element of achieving circularity, uh, it overlooks two of the most important tools in our, in our toolbox. And one of those is reduction, another is reuse. 
Uh, I believe that achieving circularity in our economy hinges upon our taking uh, an all of the above approach uh, when addressing our consumption and waste management practices. And I'm inspired by the role that reuse and uh, refill infrastructure uh, could play, can play in that uh, tran transition. My, my question of you, ma'am, would be, why is it important to consider policy options beyond just recycling as we work to create circularity within our economy? And the second half of my question is, can you share an example of, with us of a, uh, a reduction or, or maybe a reuse policy that has been effective at reducing overall waste? All right. You want me to repeat those questions? Okay. Nope, I've got notes, excellent yep. questions, Thanks. and um, I am I'm glad to answer them. Sure. I think on the question of why we need to be looking beyond recycling, we see that kind of recycling isn't adequate, both in practice and in theory. There is not enough that we can do with recycling due to um, products that are not easy to recycle, like flexible packaging and actual um, systems that are in place that aren't meeting our needs on recycling. So we have to look beyond recycling for solutions. Um, and frankly, some of the solutions outside of recycling are more appropriate for different types of products, um, are more suited to the products. And so looking upstream is kind of what EMF thinks is critical to, to meeting um, the challenges that we face. And I think when we um, think about kind of looking upstream, we, we see the great opportunity that is there. So we see that if you replace 20% of plastic packaging with reusable packaging, it's a $10 billion opportunity. If you replace 10% of the plastic packaging on the market, you can keep 50% of plastics out of the ocean annually. Um, so there's a huge opportunity here, both economically and environmentally, and we need to kind of be aware of what all of our options are when we're thinking about tackling those challenges. On your question about whether um, there are kind of reuse policies that we can point to yeah, that are... Uh, just a, oh. and a good, good example or two on, if you will, on, on uh, reduction or reuse policy. Yep. Yeah. So um, reuse policy that's effective, I think we have a number of policies that are kind of in the early stages that are really great on reuse that we're really excited about, like reuse targets that we're seeing kind of currently negotiated in the EU, um, up, up and running in, in France in the near term. But when we think about what we've seen proven time and time again, I think bottle bills are, are a classic example that we look to and across US states. Um, that we've seen they really do drive return rates, and if we're incorporating reuse into those systems, we are in a position to be getting packaging back to be reused very efficiently um, and effectively. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, is it Clements? Uh, who are you named after? So it's a French name. I thought so. All right. Uh, bienvenue. Welcome. Um, is uh, Michrit uh, Mademoiselle? Um, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that the United Nations uh, views reuse as, and I think this is a quote, the most scalable solution to reduce plastic waste at its source. Uh, how has uh, Loop been able to uh, partner with other businesses uh, such as Walmart and, uh, in order to product, promote um, re uh, reusable packaging? It's one question. And a follow-up would be how can the federal government work alongside the private sector uh, companies to scale, reuse, and refill uh, infrastructure and technology. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Kappa, for the questions. Um, Loop works with brand manufacturers and retailers to transition from a disposable system into a reusable system in the least disruptive way. So it's really about handling for, uh, for that supply chain, the reverse logistic in a way that disrupts the existing and very efficient supply chain to the least possible. Working with, you name them, Walmart, but also over 200 brand manufacturers, including Procter & Gamble and Nestle, we are able to develop reusable package that are being enjoyed by consumers, and upon return, Loop is collecting them back, sorting, storing them, cleaning them, and we also reimburse deposit. Yeah. How do you collect them back? We collect them back from the store where they are being uh, currently uh, returned by consumers or any other location that has a loop return point. Okay, good, thank you. Do 
you want me to address the question on the, yeah, on the economics? Yeah, if you would. So what's really important in the loop system, the package is an asset to the brand manufacturer as opposed to a cost of goods sold. And in making the package an asset, you enable manufacturer to innovate and create a fundamentally better package and a better ex consumer experience. This is what, as a brand manufacturer or producer, you are really thriving for, is being able to delight consumers, and that's what uh, they are able to do on a reusable package much better than on a single-use package. Mm. Any, any idea where that idea came from? That's a very clever idea. The idea of a reusable yeah, package? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think that's that a been new around idea. For a while? I, I think we call it the milkman. <laughs> <laughs> my father, uh, one day when I was in uh, uh, grade school, my colleagues and I in my school were out on the playground playing, and the folks started, um, the other kids started talking about who they were named after. And they asked who I was named after, I didn't know. And uh, that night I went home and at supper, I said to my dad, who am I named after? Uh, we don't have any Toms in our family. And he said, speak your milkman. He said, son, you're named after the milkman. <laughs> and that was when we actually had milkmen, and we had a milkman named Tom. And we moved a lot then, and, but we always had the same milkman, so who knows? I, I like milk, I, I know that, so. I'll ask if our milkman was named Clemence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Clemence, I have an, uh, another question, if, if you don't mind, dealing with lessons learned. Um, I often like to say in life that we need to find out what works and do more of that. Uh, for recycling, uh, we often look to our state or local initiatives that are successfully promoting circularity. Uh, my home state of Delaware recently passed a law that would ban food establishments from using single-use polystyrene uh, containers and other plastic items like coffee stirrers. And while we're still waiting for the governor, our governor to sign this bill into law, I look forward to the lessons that we gain uh, from uh, this Delaware law and other uh, similar legislations. I also believe that we can learn from uh, the international community, from countries beyond our borders, including France, um, about uh, successful reuse and, and uh, refill uh, policies. Uh, my, uh, my question, my next question, my, probably my last question of you, uh, Mademoiselle, uh, uh, having worked uh, to launch Loop Global across three continents, is that right, three continents? What lessons can we learn from the international community as well as from states and from municipalities when it comes to reusable or refillable products and infrastructure? Thank you for this very important question. De rien. The, the first learning is there is a market demand for reuse. Consumers are ready and already experiencing it in many sectors. So there is a need to scale, and we see this across all of the market. The second learning I will bring to this committee, as you rightly pointed it out, is some countries have already taken the forefront of working policies together with the business in order to foster and propel reuse. And in my home country, as France, which is clearly leading the way also in, uh, in Europe, we have seen reuse targets reuse mandate coming through legislation, which have fostered the creation of the reverse infrastructure, and we are seeing the market developing extremely fast. So I would summarize in making sure this government um, passes legislation to support reuse. All right, thank you. Um, is it uh, Tim? Yes. And how do you pronounce your last name, Tim? Debus. Okay, thank you. Has anyone ever mispronounced it? All the time. Like, ever, anyone ever say, I missed the bus? It, five letters, but it uh, can be tricky. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, good. Uh, Mr. Dubas, uh, what, uh, what are some of the lessons learned from your work? What are some of the lessons learned from your work at the Reusable Packaging Association that might help us achieve a more circular uh, economy? Well, the, the, and how can, how can we encourage other uh, industries to pursue policies like, uh, like incorporating uh, reusable shipping supplies, which are both good for, good, I think they're good for business, I think they're good for the environment, please. 
Go ahead. Very much so, and, and thank you. Uh, the biggest lesson is seeing reusable systems in action uh, is that they cre create tremendous opportunity and, and value within the supply chain infrastructures and the participating parties. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discovery that takes place. So when you're able, when you're incorporating a reusable packaging system, you have to know every step of the way where that package is being handled. Uh, and that opens the eyes uh, for a lot of businesses to see other improvement areas that can take place, uh, whether it's in their shipping or the warehouse, uh, whether it's their, uh, their behind the stores uh, and stocking merchandise uh, uh, for, uh, for point of sale. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities that come up uh, with reusable packaging that people discover and it becomes an aha moment of, wait, if we can do this, then this leads to other benefits. And so uh, that's the biggest takeaway that I've seen, in, in especially being in the field, is that uh, reuse uh, breeds a, a level of performance that uh, companies don't turn away from once they establish that system. Uh, they don't go back to, to a single-use uh, model uh, because they're generating benefits uh, throughout the whole system. They're, re they're saving money uh, and they're providing a better experience for those handling uh, the items. So uh, there's not a lot of turning back. Uh, and I, I think as far as uh, really cultivating reuse systems, I mentioned earlier, it's an, it's an investment. And so how can policy help with uh, investments for uh, the return or the payback uh, that takes place maybe a year or two down the line? A lot of our companies are looking at the immediate, uh, reporting second quarter, uh, how do we uh, achieve efficiencies uh, today, and sometimes that investment and in reuse uh, can take uh, uh, you know, a year or two for that payback, and for that return. And so anything now, whether it's tax breaks or grants or things that can help generate uh, the financial investment and in reuse models uh, would be very valuable. All right, good, good. One last question for uh, uh, Daisy Ming, and uh, I, uh, I believe that uh, the reuse and, and refill infrastructure uh, present a promising alternative to single-use plastics. Uh, my guess is you do too. But in the, in the Environmental Protection Agency's draft strategy to address plastic pollution, the agency describes how the federal government should use its power of acquisition and procurement to pr promote sustainable supply chains for materials that are used in federal buildings. My question, Ms. Ming, do you believe that, that our federal government could successfully implement reuse and refill uh, infrastructure in uh, some of our federal buildings? And what are maybe uh, uh, some of the best examples of single-use products that could be replaced by reuse and refill infrastructure? Wonderful question, and thank you. Yeah, the, the EPA plastic strategy is a really exciting development, and I think this is a key piece of kind of the work that we need to be doing on reuse. Um, I will point you first off to the, the GSA has an advisory committee that published kind of a roadmap exactly on this topic for different um, pilots that can be conducted both by procurement officers and um, facility specific pilots. But when we think about what are some of the, the actions that the federal government can take and what products can be transitioned to reuse, the obvious ideas are kind of um, drinking fountains as, as a replacement, kind of building the infrastructure for um, reusable water or, or water bottles. And then we can look to the food service areas, so cafeterias and other things um, that may be replaced with reusable foodware if, not, if that's not already in place. I will continue to think on that and maybe get back to you with a few additional ideas. <clears throat> Good. Well, you may have a chance to do that. We're, uh, we're uh, uh, going to uh, be uh, uh, submitting uh, questions. Some of our co uh, colleagues who are not here, and some who were here, will be submitting uh, questions to each of you uh, for we call them questions for the record, or, uh, QFRs. Um, and uh, we'll ask uh, senators to submit their questions for the record through the close of business on Thursday, August 24th, and we'll compile those questions and we'll send them to you uh, and ask you to reply to us by Thursday, August 24th. Um, and uh, closing, I, let me just thank you uh, all. Merci beaucoup. And uh, thank each of, uh, of you for appearing for us uh, today and for your, your testimony, and not but really for what you do with your lives. I hope they provide uh, the, uh, uh, I hope they provide, uh, your work provides you with great satisfaction. Mine, mine certainly does for me. The, uh, we're asking to, uh,
Yeah. The, uh, just for a point of clarification, senators will be allowed to submit questions for the records through the close of business on Thursday, August 10th. And again, we'll ask you all to respond by uh, Thursday, uh, August 24th. And uh, I don't know if they, how they say this in French, but uh, and we have a, a saying here in America, like uh, when something is over, we say that's a wrap. It's a wrap. So, uh, but uh, we're grateful to uh, to all of you. One of um, one of my uh, favorite people. Uh, uh, a favorite leaders, if you will, from other countries, is uh, the leader of France. And uh, President uh, Ms. Biden hosted a uh, state dinner for uh, French President Macron about um, a year or two ago. And I had the opportunity to chat with him a bit there. He had spoken to um, a joint session of the, uh, the Congress about two years ago. And uh, wonderful, I, I got to shake hands with him, chat with him briefly before he spoke. And in his address that day to the Joint Session of Congress, he said these words. He said, uh, this is the only planet we're going to have. And he went on to say, there's no planet B. This is the only one. And I told him at the state dinner that I have quoted him many times in saying that. And I've never given him credit for the, <laughs> for the quote. And he said, we have a special name in France for people like you <laughs> who steal our material without attribution, and then we had a good laugh. All right, um, keep up the good work. You're doing great, uh, great things for our, our planet. The only one we're going to have. Take care. With that, I think we're adjourned. Au revoir.